I skipped. No, I, I no, I skipped the week before last week, not last week. Uh, okay. Um, I, I guess you didn't know. I don't know. It's kind. Of, it's weird. Um, I will extend the deadline to next Monday. Um, but let for now though. Let me put it this way. Like, um, please, like by the deadline, submit literally whatever you have like you don't have to like wait six hours until you have some sort of attempt on every single problem like if you really could only solve three problems by the deadline just submit that like really we'll go over problems that like a lot of people didn't solve during our next lecture we'll we will post other like supplementary materials on that stuff if you guys are like actively having trouble with like a specific unit um, so yeah, please just submit like literally whatever you have. Yeah, and all because we need some office hours. Almost none of you come to office hours. So oh yeah, and that's sad because I so far the only person that I've seen on office hours was um, Arib about yeah, Isabel uh, two or three weeks ago. A couple times too. Isabel, but, okay. Yeah, but if you if you if you guys are having trouble, uh, office hours um, four thirty six thirty uh, on Saturday in the same Zoom. Right, so please come if you're having trouble. All right, um, let's get started, Andrew. All right, so this week we're gonna be talking about dynamics. Uh, so in physics, we talk about two different things. So we talk about different uh, problems involving statics and problems involving dynamics. So in statics, we're dealing with like, um, we're dealing with no net change in a system. So like the net momentum of the system, the net energy of a system doesn't change with statics. So for example, you know, if we have a, a system with friction and there's no motion, and we're trying to solve for some sort of force or we're trying to solve for some sort of constant, we know nothing is moving. And so that's our problem. Dynamics, we talk more about systems that actually change. Systems where, you know, momentum ch uh, of individual objects changes, where, um, you know, energy changes. So that is what we refer to as dynamics. And I apologize if my handwriting is terrible. This tablet got lost for three weeks. Anyway, um, so we'll, we'll talk about like a few different things regarding dynamics. We're not going to talk about rotational dynamics because my God, that is ridiculous. Uh, so we're going to talk mostly about, you know, impulse and collisions. So you guys have probably heard of impulse and you guys have probably heard of collisions. So we'll, we'll sort of breeze through like the basic definitions of what those are. And we'll talk more about you know, problem solving strategies and applying those types of things to certain problems. So you know, impulse is, um, ref, uh, we use J for impulse. Like that, that's a terrible J. But impulse just refers to the net change of the momentum of a system, right? That is, uh, or the net change of the momentum of an object or, or, or anything. So basically, um, if, for example, your car is rapidly stopping over like 0.3 seconds, you know, the impulse is going to be, the impulse generated is going to be the change in momentum of that, of like that period of time, right? So like we talk about, you know, the impulse required to shatter bones in a car crash or the impulse required to break something at high velocities, that just refers to the net change in momentum. And what does the net change in momentum really describe? Well, it describes really M delta V. So basically the impulse gives us how much, by how much an object slows down over a short period of time. And in this case, you know, J can also be rewritten in terms of, and we are recording, yes. So J can be rewritten in terms of, you know, force acted over a specific time, because we know that delta P over delta T is our force uh, exerted over a certain period of time. So J is just our F times delta T. And that's how you calculate impulse. And you know this is what we call the impulse momentum theorem, uh, which relates you know impulse to change in momentum. Delta is a Greek letter that refers to change. So if you ever see in a math class, you know like delta y over delta x to describe slope, that's the change 
in y over the change in x. So we use capital delta to describe changes uh, in things. Uh, I hope that clears it up. So uh, f delta t means f minus t? So f delta t means f times t final minus t initial. So this is your change in t. So for example, you know, at if we say t initial equals zero seconds, we start measuring at t equals zero seconds, mm -hmm. and then our final t is three seconds, then our delta t equals three minus zero or three seconds. So the amount of time that has elapsed is three seconds. Mm -hmm. So uh, using this, we now understand impulse. And impulse is a very big thing in uh, dynamics uh, because you know, it allows us to describe, first of all, by how much an object needs to slow down over a period of time, you know, how much force needs to be imparted on an object at, at a given period of time uh, in order to calculate it. So uh, another big reason that we related momentum, uh, that we related uh, J to um, forces F is because a lot of times you will see on, um, on the F equals MA or on any sort of contest, you're going to see some sort of graph, right? You're going to see some sort of graph of the force over a certain period of time. So it's going to look something, for example, like this, right? So like this, uh, your force is going to change with time as the object is, is getting smashed, right? So, and Using this graph, you need to calculate the impulse imparted on the object over some sort of period of time. Well, here's your delta t, right? This is how much time elapses because you know zero force is being imparted when the momentum becomes zero. So when the object stops, the momentum is zero. So the force imparted on it is, is now zero because the momentum is no longer changing with respect to time. And this area, or the integral, if, if the, if the uh, graph looks weirder, is your impulse j. Right, because this is just F delta T. Well, in this case, F delta T over two, right? Um, so, because it's a triangle. So this is your J. So that's impulse. Impulse is the very basic, um, is a very basic thing in dynamics. So, you know, there's, a not, there's not like that much you can do with impulse, especially in F equals MA problems. You're usually gonna see something a bit more complicated, but this is fundamentally, our segue into dynamics and into things in dynamics. Alvin, do you have like anything you want to add in, in terms of impulse? Yeah, I was muted, sorry. Um, yeah, not exactly. So yeah, most of the time you're just gonna have to find a graph, but also I've seen like some problems where you have to know what the conceptual uh, side of what impulse is, which is basically um, like, you know, if you were to throw something in space, right? Then like, what is the impulse for you to go in like a certain direction? Yeah, but like, these are really weird problems. We'll get to them sometime. Mm -hmm. So like for now, fundamentally, impulse is just force imparted on us over a certain period of time, right? And yeah, and it's especially useful because the reason impulse is used a lot in dynamics is because with impulse, your force is changing. So, you know, this graph, in this graph, we can clearly see that the force is first increasing, then it's decreasing. So impulse is very useful when it comes to, you know, looking at systems where the force over time changes. So you use the graph and you calculate the total impulse, right? So you find the average force imparted on an object over a certain period of time. So that's impulse. So let's now, so let's, let's just title this impulse. So more importantly, now we move into our very, the very big topic that comes up a lot on the F equals MA. It comes up a lot in physics problems. It comes up a lot in dynamics. And, you know, I already mentioned the name of this, so it kind of is moot, but collisions. You know, what's a collision?
when two things go bam. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> when two objects come in contact with each other. Yep, that is fundamentally one, the noun form of collide, yes. Uh, wait, what? The noun form collide. That, that's so, sort of a circular definition, isn't it? Okay, so, okay. A collision is when two objects come in contact with each other, all right? That's my, my hands have just collided. You know, if I drop something, the pencil has collided with the table. Uh, it's weird. Like nobody says that the table has the, the that the table and the and the pen ha pencil have collided with each other. But fundamentally, yes, that is exactly what happened. So there are two different types of collisions. There are elastic collisions and inelastic collisions. Does anybody want to venture a guess as to the difference between these two collisions? No physics yet, just like conceptually, what is the difference? Okay, I'm seeing loss of energy. Yes, that's you're on the right track. Something in KMT, uh, but I'm looking for something simple. So Jeremy hit it exactly what I wanted, bouncy and not bouncy. Well, what does it mean for something to be elastic? Well, it bounces, you know? You throw a rubber ball on the floor, it's elastic. It will stretch and squeeze and it'll bounce, it'll bounce. And an inelastic collision is if I drop like, you know, a, a pool ball on the floor or a billiard ball, because I am European, we call it billiard balls. So you drop a billiard ball on the floor and it doesn't bounce, or at least it shouldn't bounce. You know, you'll never find a perfectly inelastic collision. You will always see some sort of little tiny bounce, but you know, in an ideal world, the, the ball would just fall and not bounce. So, I have to say you like Conan and it's really cool. Uh, sure. Uh, oh, I look like Conan because of the bouncy hair. Yes. Uh, anyway, um, back to this. Um, so yes, you guys started talking about um, changes in loss and energy. So you guys wanna try to go a little bit more into that. So. When an object, so we know by the law of conservation of momentum that we covered a few weeks back, that in a closed system, all the, the net momentum is conserved. So, you know, delta P equals zero. That is our fundamental law of conservation of momentum for a closed system. So we know that in an elastic collision, uh, collision momentum is conserved. And in an, e, in an e, inelastic collision, excuse me, the momentum is also conserved. So then, what's the difference between the two? Uh, because in an, in an elastic collision, it bounces. In an inelastic collision, it doesn't. What does it mean for an object to bounce? Like, why does an object bounce? Like, what does that say about it? So momentum isn't transferred. Um, well, um, what do you mean? Like. Potential to kinetic. Okay, well, potential is always converted to kinetic energy whenever an object starts moving, right? So, uh, Alvin, we covered energy, right? Like to some extent. Yeah. Um, well, last week we did kinetic and potential energy, and like forces that convert between the two. Cool. So you know that you know as soon as an object starts moving, its potential energy already starts getting converted to kinetic energy. So, um, like in, in an elastic and in an inelastic collision, the same thing happens, right? As when the object starts moving, the energy is converted from potential to kinetic. So we're looking for something more. You guys are you guys are circling around the right term, energy. So what happens to the energy of the system in elastic versus inelastic collisions? Kinetic energy is conserved, perfect. So Jeremy, in which collision, in which type of collision is kinetic energy conserved? Elastic, yes, exactly. So the kinetic energy, Ke, is that, that is one too many lines, but it is conserved. in elastic collisions, right? 
And how do we know this? Well, I mean, if a ball hits the ground, it's, it's, it's traveling at a certain speed, right? One half mv squared is its, is its kinetic energy. You know, it, that's, that's the energy at the time of the collision. And when it bounces, it's still moving. You know, it still has a velocity of one half, m, it still has some sort of velocity of one half mv squared. So uh, Jeremy, you're raising your hand, yes. Uh, is this like a property of elastic collisions or is this how elastic collisions are defined? Uh, it is, I'm pretty, yeah, it's, I'm pretty sure it's how elastic collisions are defined. Um, uh, okay. Yes, the, yeah. there are recordings that will be posted after the meet. Mm -hmm. Just be sure to watch them. They'll also be uploaded to our website, sciphg.org. Um, okay, so we'll, yeah. Um, adios. So yes, elastic collisions are defined by their properties. Let me put it like that. Elastic collisions are defined by their properties that momentum and kinetic energy are both conserved and any elastic collisions are defined by their property that only momentum is conserved. Um, yeah. Because, you know, what happens if like two objects uh, hit each other and just collide and stick together? Well, what's the kinetic energy? The kinetic energy is just going to be, you know, uh, it's going to be uh, one half p and then times some sort of other v squared. You know, it's it's not going to be it's not going to be conserved because with an any with an elastic collision, with a perfectly elastic collision, if we have two objects and they bounce off of each other, you know, it's going to have you know one half m v initial squared, and this is one half m v final squared. And then it'll just bounce off each other and, you know, it'll still be, oh, sorry, V initial one squared and V initial two squared. Uh, and it'll be one half MV final one squared and one half MV final oops, two squared. It's getting messy, but the point is the, ki the kinetic energy in this, uh, in elastic collisions is going to be conserved, but the inelastic collisions isn't going to be conserved. Um, Anyway, sorry for that. Um, this means we can do some interesting things with both types of collisions. Um, and when we have problems where we have objects colliding with each other, then we can immediately write out equations for those, um, uh, for those types of collisions. So um, fundamentally speaking, Let's just look at it like a, a very basic example. You know, if we have, with a perfectly elastic collision, all the kinetic energies are going to be conserved. So, you know, if we have one object of mass m1 moving at a speed v1, uh, we know that its momentum is going to be m1 v1. And we have another object of mass m2 with a momentum v2, and uh, it's uh, with a velocity v2, and its momentum p2 is going to be m2 v2 which means that the total momentum p tot is m1 v1 plus m2 v2, which means p initial, oops, p initial is going to be equal to p final, which is equal to m1 v1 plus m2 v2. No matter how fast one of the balls is one of the balls or the other ball is moving at the end of that collision, the total momentum is still going to be m1 v1 plus m2 v2. This is universal regardless of whether or not it's an elastic or an inelastic collision. And we can see, you know, in this case, right, if we have a, a small ball bouncing against a bigger ball, you know, which ball is going to be moving faster at the end of the collision? The smaller one, right. Because, you know, the smaller one has a much smaller mass. And if in the end, the momentum is, is uh, if in the end, the momentum is conserved, you know, the force that one of them will impart on the other, you know, the small ball is just going to move much faster. And the bigger one, its speed isn't going to change. Like, it's basically not going to change. For extreme situations, right, if I fall onto the ground, if I jump up and fall to the ground and I collide with the earth, you don't see the earth flying away, right? It's, it's mostly just me who basically stops moving. Or like if I bounce 
a rubber ball against a bigger, like, I don't know, a bigger rubber ball, the small rubber ball is just gonna shoot backwards like a bullet. And then the big rubber ball is barely gonna move. Um, so yeah, regardless, the final momentum is gonna be M1 V1 plus M2 V2. And in this case also, the kinetic energy of the first ball, K1, I'm gonna use K instead of KE because KE is just too many letters and K2. The kinetic energy of the first one is going to be one half m one v one squared, and here it's going to be one half m two v two squared, right? So the total kinetic energy, k toad, is going to be one half m one v one squared plus m two uh, v two squared. And since the kinetic energy in an elastic collision is conserved, then K initial is going to be equal to K final, which is 1 half M1 V1 squared plus M2 V2 squared. Simple, right? So if we have a system with uh, N objects, the momentum is going to be, it's going to be M1 V1 plus M2 V2 plus all the way to Mn Vn, or just sum as I goes from one, or one, not minus one, to N of Mi Vi. And that's going to, remain the case regardless of what collision happens. And the kinetic energy K for elastic collisions is going to be equal to 1 half M1 V1 squared plus all the way to 1 half Mn Vn squared, or just 1 half sum as I goes from 1 to N of mi vi squared. And these are the two fundamental important formulas when it comes to collisions. If you ever see a collision, think these two formulas. You see an elastic collision, these two. Inelastic, just the first. So now we need to go over some uh, we, we need to talk about uh, distinguishing elastic versus inelastic collisions. So distinguishing types of collisions. I apologize if my handwriting is a little sloppy today. So how do we distinguish types of collisions? So if two objects bounce apart, bounce, bounce apart from each other and we're given that no kinetic energy is lost. What is that? It, exactly, it's elastic. And even more than that, it's perfectly elastic. A collision where no kinetic energy is lost is what's known as a perfectly elastic collision. And we have, you know, partially elastic, uh, and then partially elastic collisions is when, like, um, is what we see um, in real life, where we see a bit of kinetic energy is always lost. Like, for example, heat. Like, for example, how do we know for a fact that if I bounce a rubber ball against another rubber ball, that it is not a perfectly elastic collision? Like, what thing about that action, about that scenario, will give away immediately that it's not perfectly elastic? They don't go back to their initial positions after bouncing and sound. So they don't go back to their initial positions after bouncing. Uh, well, that would imply that, um, uh, that would imply that like, um, 
they just completely stop moving because of some other thing. No, that's a bit different. Uh, the sound, yes, that's right. Because what is sound? Sound is the two things rubbing against each other and producing some sort of sound wave. So, um, yeah. If you hear a bounce, then you know that it's not perfectly elastic. Uh, so perfectly elastic is not really a thing that we talk about. We usually just refer to everything as elastic because if there's any kind of kinetic energy loss, it's already partially inelastic. So I kind of sort of lied a little bit about this terminology. Just if there is no kinetic energy loss, it is elastic. Just put it that way. And then if there's any kind of loss of kinetic energy, it's already partially inelastic. So, you know, we'll just put quotation marks here. And then we have partially inelastic. And the problem is with a partially inelastic collision, there is going to be kinetic energy loss. So you can't really use the formula that, you know, Ke final equals Ke initial because that's not true. So unfortunately, when you have any kind of energy loss, all you can work with is, you know, the conservation of momentum, unless you know exactly how much energy is lost. But even then, you're not really going to be told. You're not, it's not really going to give you much. However, there, are, uh, there is another case. If two objects hit each other, how do we know that a collision is perfectly inelastic? So there is like, what, what we call a perfectly inelastic collision is kind of funny, but what do you guys think it means for something to be pers uh, they explode. Um, like they make a big sound wave. Well, perfectly inelastic means that there is an absolute change in one thing and no change in the other. So we know that there's no change in momentum. But the problem is, if they explode, there's still kinetic energy at the end, right? Because each of the little particles still have to fly out in opposite directions. The particles stay still. Yes. If the particles stick together, Mm, exactly. If the particles stick together, then there is an absolute kinetic energy loss. So that's what we refer to as a perfectly inelastic collision. So if you ever see on like a physics test or anywhere that two objects collide and stick together, that is a perfectly inelastic collision. Um, so yeah, those are the types of collisions. So really at this point, um, that's kind of basically it regarding collisions. So like the only thing that's important now to know here is that, um, the only thing to know here is just like how to distinguish these types of collisions and work with the different formulas pertaining to those types of collisions. Yes. So, Alvin, you want to explain what you mean by in, uh, inelasticity is not a property of objects? Uh, I was just responding to uh, Jeremy's question. Um, yeah. So, mag are magnets inelastic? Um, well, because like because they stick, right? I guess you can say um, they produce inelastic collisions, but um, you can't really say a magnet is inelastic in and of itself because you use elasticity to describe a collision and not an object. That's, yeah. Um, yeah, and magnets are also a little bit weirder because different forces apply to them than apply to regular objects, right? Because, you know, what force is acting if I move an object closer to another object? Well, gravity. The problem is gravity between small objects is so incredibly weak that it's essentially irrelevant. Right, because if I stick out, you know, this thing and I hold it to my computer, after a certain period of time, technically the computer and this pen case should stick together. They should be drawn together. The problem is it'll take more time, like than like, I don't know, three and a half universal universe lifetimes. So it's essentially irrelevant that gravity acts on this. 
So unless you're dealing with super precise measurements in like some sort of physics lab, gravity is irrelevant on a small scale. The problem is magnetism is not irrelevant on this kind of scale, especially with too strong enough bar magnets. Because if I put a bar magnet five centimeters away from another bar magnet, they're going to be drawn together because of their intertwining uh, magnetic fields. So you have to start taking into account that and it gets a little bit weird. Because with magnetic fields, it's not like the atoms bounce apart from each other. They kind of just sort of are drawn together. In the same way that van der Waals forces act on like tiny, tiny atoms like close together. So it's a completely different um, uh, force. And whoever's drawing that smiley, nice. Uh, so yes. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So. One last important thing to know regarding um, collisions and dynamics and everything is what's known as the center of mass. Because if we have two carts, right, that are moving and stick together, because the net momentum doesn't change, the cart has to move in, in one direction if the carts are not the exact same size, right? If the carts are not the exact same size, if the carts are the exact same size, they will collide, stick together, and stay completely motionless, right? Because the, what, what was the initial momentum, right? The initial momentum is, well, m1 v1, and then minus m1 v1, because it's moving in an opposite direction, because momentum is a vector. So the initial momentum of this two-cart system is zero. So in a perfect, perfectly elastic collision, in elastic collision, they collide, they stick together, and they stand still, because the initial momentum was zero, and now this momentum is zero. But for other cases, when one cart is you know, slightly larger or slightly smaller than another cart, it will move in one direction because it's going to be like m1 v1 minus m2 v2. That's still a positive value. So it's going to be m1 plus m2 because the two objects are one object now, essentially, times some sort of v3. And um, when dealing with multiple objects colliding, it's very useful to deal with the center of mass of that system. Because when two objects collide and stick together, they are essentially now, in physics uh, terms, one object, one unit. It's, like it's, it's meaningless to examine them as two separate carts because they're moving in the exact same direction at the exact same speed. So they are essentially one big object. So in order to work with it, and in order to work with properties regarding this two-cart system, we try to find the center of mass of that system. And um, now the center of mass of that system is calculated you know, uh, by taking what's known as you know, a weighted average of uh, the x position and the y position of uh, their uh, masses. So like, if we consider like, some sort of system with you know, multiple particles, uh, hi, Arib. Uh, to, if we consider some sort of uh, system with like uh, k particles, for example, then we can find the uh, location of the center of mass uh, by the x component and the y component of each particle. Because um, what happens is, OK, so Arib, sorry, just to quickly catch you up. We've talked about collisions, elastic and inelastic collisions, how to distinguish them, and the formulas that uh, are useful to know for the different types of collisions. And we've also talked a little bit about impulse. So now we're talking about calculating the center of mass of a system. Mm -hmm. So the center of mass takes, is calculated then by taking a weighted average. So what we do is to find the x coordinate, we take the sum of uh, you know, these k particles of all the masses times their x positions and divide it by the sum of their masses. And you, know, you usually say, oh, well, don't these cancel? Well, not really, no. It's, it's, they don't really cancel. It's, it's a little bit complicated. So the idea here is that, um, uh, you're taking a weighted average because you're talking about the different masses and their x positions. So this is how we define the center of mass, the x position of the center of mass. And then the y position of the center of mass is the exact same thing, m uh, k y k over uh, m k. 
So that's our center of mass in terms of position. And in this case, what we can also do is we can find the velocity of the center of mass, again, by taking a weighted average of the velocities. Now, I'm using the word weighted average. So uh, type a Y in the chat if you, if you know what a weighted average is, or like if you've heard the term and kind of sort of understand what it is. Okay, so Arib says M. So Arib, do you want to tell me what like a, a standard average is? What's, what's the standard average? Add up all the terms and uh, divide by the number of terms. Exactly, and that's your average. So the problem is when you take that kind of average, you're assuming that every single object holds the exact same weight and has the exact same impact on your total. So for example, if I'm trying to find like the average weight, you know, each, each single individual weight contributes the exact same impact to this net total. But a weighted average refers to, you know, different things taking different impacts. So for example, an AP class, if you're taking the, if you're taking a weighted GPA, if you take, uh, I'll talk about GPAs because I'm in college application crunch mode. So, so, so is this what people, our teachers mean when they say like um, tests and homework are weighted differently? Exactly. Because you're not just, if you have tests, projects, if you have tests, projects, homework and exams, a standard average would just be those three things added together divided by three. So each one is worth 30% of your grade. The problem is exams are arguably more important than individual homework assignments. So they weight each individual test has more of an impact on your grade than an individual homework assignment. So in order to, in order to calculate your grade, you take a weighted average of those homework assignments. Because you know, if you get a perfect score on all of your, ex on all of your homework assignments and you get you know, an 80, on all of your tests, you know, depending on uh, depending on how many tests and how many homeworks are taken, that is worse in a lot of cases than if you get a perfect score on all of your tests, but you get 80s on your assignments. Just because tests are usually weighted three to four times as much as homeworks are. So, you know, an 80 on a homework assignment isn't really gonna do much to your to your um, average, but an 80 on a test is going to bring it down a few points. So how do you um, weight these things? How do you weight the two things? How do you weight them? Yeah. Well, that's what we do when we take the sum. So you see, a standard average would just be like, um, you know, the sum of all of your xk, right, uh, divided by k, for example. That's your average for the position, right? That's your average for the position. But the problem is the center of mass refers to where all the mass in your system is concentrated, right? And if you have one massive ball next to a tiny ball, like a basketball next to a tennis ball, the center of mass isn't gonna be like right in between the tennis ball and the basketball because the basketball is just so much bigger and more massive than the tennis ball. It's going so it's to be closer. Side. Yeah, exactly. It's going to be closer to the basketball than it is to the tennis ball. Uh, and that's why we have this specific, this sort of layout. So you're taking a weighted average because you have to factor into account how much of an impact the mass has. So, um, okay, to, just to briefly answer Benny's question, Technically speaking, AP classes are weighted standardly. They're standardly worth 1.5 times a regular grade, but most colleges take an unweighted GPA, which means no, they are not weighted. Um, so yes, um, that's what a weighted average is. So, so weighted what is average, XK again? X? XK is, is the, the X position of each of the Kth particle, right? So if we have a system of K particles, you know, the the position the x position of the kth particle is xk. So if this only works if the particles are in a straight line, though, right? Because otherwise you'd have to use like vectors or something. No, the x position the the weighted average of the x position is only dependent on the x position. 
the oh, way I get it. You're doing it shift. separately for each dimension. Exactly. Because if it was in a straight line, I wouldn't have to say X. I could just say, you know, position like, I don't know, like some sort of P or S. But because we live in multiple dimensions, we usually use either two in standard physics, like basic physics that you're going to cover, or three if you get to like harder stuff. Like in physics C, you might see some occasional problems where you have to deal with three dimensions and you're going to have a Z dimension where you calculate the center of mass of a three-dimensional system. Exactly. And you guys can see now why this doesn't perfectly cancel. Because you can't just say, oh, M1 cancels with M1, M2 cancels with M2, M3 cancels. You can't do that. That doesn't, that's not how math works. So it's, you're, giving, you're giving each individual position here its own unique weight. And if M1 is significantly bigger than M2, then M1X1 is going to carry significantly more weight than M2X2. So exactly, that's like, that's why technically the Earth and the Moon orbit what's called a barycenter. So you're going to hear barycenter a lot, like when you, when, it, when you do like, when you do astronomy and stuff, because technically the Earth and the Moon orbit some sort of point in between the two of them, called, or so some point between the two of them called the barycenter, because the Moon has a mass and the Earth also has a mass. But the problem is because the Earth is so much more massive compared to the moon and the moon is just so much further away, the barycenter is basically inside the Earth's core. It's not exactly smack in the middle of the Earth's core, but it's basically there. So the Earth will wiggle a little bit in its orbit. Oh, so, th so the Earth has its own orbit with respect to the moon. Yeah, exactly. The moon still tugs on the Earth. So the Earth and the moon technically orbit a third point between them, but because the Earth is so big with respect to the Moon, you don't feel that wobbling, and that's kind of like a binary system. Yeah, but it, it's it's technically a binary system, but the effect that the Moon has on the Earth is so minuscule that it's essentially just you know the Moon is orbiting the Earth. Got it's it. the same. It's the same with the Sun, right? The Earth will tug on the Sun, but because the Sun is 160,000 times bigger in radius than the Earth or 860,000 times bigger, like, no, sorry, 100,000 times bigger. Yeah, there we go. I'll leave it at that. Because the, because the sun is 100,000 times bigger than the earth is, the, the, the very center is, yeah, pretty much near, very near the center of the sun. Even though technically speaking, the sun and the earth orbit each other, but the amount that the sun wobbles in its orbit is basically non-existent. And again, you can keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah. So that's why weighted averages are super important because, you know, with smaller systems, with, you know, like a tennis ball and a basketball, it's much more important because, yeah, okay, the center of mass is going to be basically inside the, the basketball, but it's going to be significantly further away from the center of the basketball with respect to the size of the basketball because a basketball is not that big. So a centimeter away from the center of the basketball is already a significant difference. And if you take more and more and more objects, you know, calculating that center of mass gets more and more complicated. But fundamentally, you're taking a weighted average. This is what it is. Does, does that make sense to everybody now? Like what a weighted average is and why it's important? Because fundamentally speaking, if a force acts on, an, on a system of multiple objects, it's going to be the F total is going to be, or the, the F acting on the center of mass of the system is going to be A of the acceleration of the center of mass times the net sum of all the masses. Or like what we call, we usually call the sum of the little masses a big M. That is not an M. I'm going to rewrite that because my God, that is not an M. So FCM is going to be big M and then the acceleration of the center of mass. There we go. So that fundamentally is basically all you need to know. Um, Alvin, do you have like anything else you want to add with regards to you know dynamics? Because then I'll just quickly cover problem solving strategies and then we can just use the next hour just to start working on the problem set 
I guess, if, if, if there are problems available. Um, I mean, we still have yet to go over the proof of the conservation of momentum and also uh, the formulas for elastic collisions, right? Okay. So, okay, the proof of the, of the, proof of the conservation of momentum. I'll do that. Um, so could you make a new page for me, please? Sure. Oh, Ariba is raising his hand. Yes, Ariba? Uh, so uh, the acceleration of the center of mass, how do you calculate that? Oh, I'm it's... back. I should go back, please. Oh, yeah. Okay, so um, actually, it doesn't fit here. Uh, let's go to a new page. <laughs> so, yeah, I forgot to cover, you know, the velocity of the center of mass. All right, sure. Go ahead. So again, velocity in the center of mass, you take the exact same weighted average, right? Because what affects the velocity, you know, it's also dependent on the mass. So the center of mass of this, uh, the, the velocity of the center of mass of the system is going to be, you know, again, mk vk over mk. And the exact same thing with the acceleration of the center of mass. It's going to be mk ak over mk. So that's how you calculate the center of mass, the acceleration of the center of mass. Because again, it's dependent on the mass. It's weighted literally based on the mass of your system. So that's how you calculate weighted average of the um, acceleration of the center of mass. Cool. So uh, Alvin, take it away with the proof. All right. So. Uh Wait, don't erase that. <laughs> I took, I made a new page. All right, cool, cool. So uh, first of all, like in regards to the velocity and acceleration of the center of mass, uh, you could go back. Yeah, so like this is, anyone want to like try to guess as to like why this is true, where you can just like, if you have the position is a weighted average, then the velocity and acceleration can also be a weighted average. So why, why do you think that is? Derivative, so um, physics magic. <laughs> That's not really, I think, physics magic. Um, yeah, so like, what about the derivative, Ari? Um, I don't, does that have something to do with like series or something? Uh, not exactly. So like, remember what um, sum means, right? So you have the, uh, so we'll, we'll just worry about the uh, x velocity and the x acceleration because you can extend it to multiple direction, uh, multiple uh, dimensions and like it would be the same, right? So the x position of the center of mass is equal to um, m1 to x1 plus m2 x2 all the way up to uh, m1 plus m2 uh, plus dot dot dot. Right, so like, what can we do to the numerator? Um, I think you can factor out the m, m1s. Uh, you can't really m factor because this is m1, this is m2, right? So it's oh, the sum right. of mk, vk, where the index is k. So each m and each x is different, right? But then like, what you can do is you can split up the fraction, right? So this is equal to m1, x1 over, I'm gonna call the bottom just like sum of all m. Or I'm going to call it oh, big M. M. Big M, yeah. Because big M is like the sum of the mass, right? So it's like a big value, so big M. So M1, X1 over big M plus M2, X2 over big M plus da, 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 right? Okay, so now we can take the derivative with respect to time on both sides, right? So um, first of all, what is the uh, dx? over dx dt. What is dx dt from kinematics? Velocity. Yeah, this is velocity. More specifically, this is the velocity of the center of mass, right? But then now let's look at the right side. So, um, so if I have ddt of like um, f of x or like, dt of like x1 plus x2, then what do I get here?
like what can I do um, with the linearity of the, yeah, that's right. It's V1 plus V2, which is uh, the sum rule of derivatives, which is to say DDT X1 plus X2 is gonna be equal to DDT, I guess it does, I don't know. It's gonna be DDT of X1 plus DDT of X2. Right, and this is gonna be equal to V1 plus V2. So we can apply the same principle here, right? So then uh, because M1 over big M, that's gonna be called, a, that's gonna be a constant, right? Because um, the mass isn't gonna change with respect to time. So we can factor this out and then we just get M1 V1 over M, right? Plus M1, uh, M2 V2 over M plus dot dot dot. Right. And then when you look at this formula, uh, let's just call this formula two. This is formula one. Right. So formula two, this matches up exactly with the velocity of the center of mass thing over here. Right. Or the velocity of the center of mass is equal to m1 v1 plus m2 v2 plus dot 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 all the way over uh, all the all over the sum of all the masses, which is the sum of all mk, which is uh, this is big M. Right. So any questions about um, center of mass and like linearity? So um, then in that case, why is it that I can say that the acceleration of the center of mass is equal to the sum of all m times a over sum of m? Yes, yeah, the same logic, right? I can do the same thing again, where I can say, um, right, this is for like three. Uh, where I can say DDT of V1 plus V2 is equal to A1 plus A2, right? So which is why I can like split it up again and do the exact same thing. And then what I end up with is the sum of MKAK over MK, over the sum of MK, right? And again, like this is big M, which is the sum. Uh, any questions on this whatsoever? Looks like something from Taylor's Mechanics. If you say so. Cool. Uh, let's move on to the next page. Right. So um, I'm going to prove um, the conservation of momentum. And this is really a simple kind of proof. Okay, so for this, we're just going to sort of assume that there are two objects that are interacting with each other, right? Assume two objects that interact somehow. Okay, and then like you can sort of um, extend this to more objects, sort of uh, with like, this kind of inductive mindset where, you know, if it works for two and then with two, it works for three and then so on. It works for more and more objects and then you can prove it like in general, right? But then um, I'm gonna just show this for two objects that interact. So when two objects interact, then they apply a force onto each other, right? So I'm gonna call like this object one uh, and like this thing, like object two, right? And then it could be, uh, the force could be applied through either contact uh, with collisions or not through contact. For example, with gravity, right? Like two objects are going to have a gravitational pull towards each other. So um, anyways, so let's just say um, object one exerts a force on object two, right? Okay, so now we're going to cite Newton's third law. So what does Newton's third law tell us in this situation? So if this is the force exerted on two or exerted on one by two, right? Um, one exerts, okay, so it should be, the arrow should be elsewhere, not here. Um, 
Right, so one exerts a force on two. So there's a force exerted by one, like something like that. Force uh, on two by one. All right, so what does Newton's third law tell us here? Like what else, what is missing from this diagram? I assume two objects in two right? Uh, okay, for F12. So what about F12? F12 is equal and opposite, right? So therefore, two exerts an equal and opposite force on one, i.e. F21 is equal to the negative of F12. All right, so then I can draw uh, this sort of anti-parallel vector here. Uh, that doesn't look the best, but it'll do. This is the force that particle two exerts on particle one, right? Okay, so um, this object will have a mass of m1, right? And this object will have mass, uh, will have like m2. Okay, so we just established that um, like these two forces are equal and opposite. So um, if the force, if F12, we also know from Newton's second law, right? The more rigorous version of Newton's second law that force is equal to the change in momentum over the change in time, right? Or, you know, um, yeah, it's equal to the change in momentum over the change in time. So then, uh, if we were to look at the momentum of, if we were to look at the momentum of um, particle one, right? We can call upon the impulse momentum theorem again. So J is equal to like PF minus PI uh, equal, and J is equal to F times delta T, right? So times delta t is equal to pf minus pi. Um, and this is going to be f12. So now I want to find the change in momentum. Uh, so this is change in momentum for particle one. And now I want to find change in momentum of particle two. And this is going to be equal to like F21 uh, uh, delta T is equal to, uh, I'm going to call this PF1 and PI1. This is going to be PF2 minus PI2. Okay, so what about F2? What is the relationship between F21 and F12 that can like make everything cancel out and is like pretty nice? One is the opposite of the other, right? So this is, we can write this as the negative of F12, right? Let's write these all as vectors. So then therefore, like if we add the two expressions that we have here, then we're gonna get zero on the left-hand side. So when we add, we get zero because negative F12 delta T and F12 delta T and their negatives, uh, if one is the negative of the other, then they add out to zero, right? Then this is gonna be zero is equal to delta P of particle one plus delta P of particle two, right? So that means um, particle one is going to have some change in momentum when acted upon by another object, right? when acted upon by object two. And then object two is always is also going to have a change in momentum, which is delta P2. But then if you add together the change in their momentums, it's ultimately gonna add up to zero, 
which is why the total momentum in a system is always just going to be conserved because any like it, given any interaction between them due to Newton's uh, second or Newton's third law, their changes in momentum is just going to be zero. Okay, any questions? Uh, sorry, so the right hand of the equation, how does it add up to delta P1 plus delta P2? Right, so um, impulse momentum says that um, J is equal Oh wait, uh, never mind, I, I got it. it, it because uh, PF2 minus P I two is uh, delta P two and yeah okay I I got it yeah so then uh, the forces are negatives so when you add them the left hand side becomes zero and the right hand side is the sum of the changes in momentum okay um, anyone have any other questions so uh, cool thing. yeah P delta P two is the uh, you're suggesting that it's the negative of delta P1. So you're saying uh, um, if there is a change in momentum, the other object will have the exact opposite change in momentum to preserve momentum. Yeah, that's exactly right. So therefore, um, because one change is the negative of the other, the total momentum will stay the same. Thus momentum is conserved. Thus momentum. In a closed system. In a closed system. Right, so, um, so yeah, now's a good time for a break, guys. So we'll see you mm -hmm. at 5.45. And I'm actually going to bounce uh, because I have something that I need to attend to. So um, we will, I guess, go through problem solving strategies after this. Uh, yeah, we'll go through cool. a couple of problems. Um, so again, I see please anything. come to office hours. Like uh, that's my parting parting plea. Please come to office hours. Ask us questions. Submit the piece sets on time. Please, 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 please. See everyone later. Boy, I'm gonna, um, let me let me the whiteboards. Yeah, or you close save up. the whiteboards. So how do I? I saved the whiteboards. I have stopped the share. All right. Bye, Steven. And let me pause. Uh, you, I think you need to pause the recording, I guess, for the break. So as I was saying, if, if you know the velocities or the accelerations of some components of the system, but you also know the acceleration of the center of mass, then um, you can solve for like the missing pieces, right? Like, you can solve for the acceleration or the velocity of like one of the components of the system based on everything else, right? So like um, you can say like the acceleration of the center of mass is equal to um, like M1A1 plus uh, M2A2 over, uh, let's just say there's like two things in a system, right? M1, M2, right? So that means um, if you were to apply a force on the entire system, right? Like for example, there's a group of things up in the sky and then gravity is acting on them and causing them to like fall individually. So uh, you can say that um, F is equal to M1 plus M2 times A, right? But then we know that like this A um, is the acceleration of the center of mass. Right, because this is just what you get when you move this over. And then this is equal to the acceleration of the mass times acceleration of the individual components of the system, right? It equals to M1A1 plus M2A2. So like, therefore, um, you can sort of generalize this to either a continuous body or just a system with many particles that the center of mass represents the point in a system in which if you were to shrink the entire system into a point particle, which is something extremely powerful because you do not want to work with big systems. You want to work with point particles. These are much easier to deal with. If you were to shrink the entire system into a point particle, it would be at the center of mass. And this is why it is um, extremely powerful. And then like in this case, you know, if you know um, 
the acceleration of the in entire system. Uh, for a continuous body, you start doing integrals. Um, but I don't want to do that because it is not on the, you're not really required to do so on any like exam. But then, you know, just in case you're curious, um, XCM, so like, so this is the sum of all the M, right? All the M's, right? But then uh, because, um, because you're just summing together like the entire weight of the object, the entire mass of the object, then just get like the M of the object, right? And then here, instead of uh, the sum of all like uh, X, uh, X sub K times M sub K, uh, you consider like the X component of uh, the X coordinates of individual like tiny pieces of mass, right? So instead of the sum of X sub K M K, uh, what you get is um, the integral of the mass of, or not the integral of like the X as a, of X as a function of mass dm, all right? Uh, and then you do this for Y as well. And then this is the generalized. Uh, you don't need to know this because yeah, you just don't need to know this. Okay. Um, yeah, so an example of this, right? So if I were, if I had a, a long stick, right? And let's just say like the stick is uniform, which means that the density is the same over all parts of the stick, right? Then where would the center of mass of the stick be? The middle. Yeah, good. Um, give me just a second here. All right. Okay, so yeah, the center of mass would be in the center. And uh, let's 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 just say that you decided to throw this stick, right? And then it sort of went through, uh, you know, parabolic motion. But then, before when we talked about parabolic motion, it was all like in the form of a ball, right? A point particle, and it's gonna, you know, follow certain rules based on, uh, you know, how gravity acts and all that. But then, if you were to throw a stick, right? What would the stick do in the air? that would you know, sort of cause trouble. Like, since the stick isn't a point particle, what can it do in the air that makes, it, it, it's gonna rotate, right? So then, so for example, if you were to follow, it depends on, I mean, yeah, I guess so. But um, given some like random throw, right? The stick is probably going to rotate. So if you were to follow the, if you were to follow the endpoint. Okay, yeah, so random throw. Well, let's consider the random throw, right? Where the stick spins, which is like probably most of the time if you just threw it randomly. If you were to follow the endpoint of the stick, right? It's going to be going through both parabolic motion and the rotating motion. So it's gonna look something like this. So is this something that you really wanna solve for? Like what is the what is the x and y coordinate of uh, of the end of the stick at you know t equals to five seconds? Yeah, no, you don't want to do that, right? But it turns out because of the property of the center of mass that you know if you were to condense this into a point particle, it would follow the center. Uh, the center of mass is going to follow like all the rules of the point particle, right? So if you were to follow the center point instead of the end point you're going to get back your really pretty parabola. Uh, so this is like the endpoint, And this is the midpoint. The midpoint is going to just be a parabola. And then uh, each point 
the stick can be at different, the stick can be at like different positions in its rotation, but that doesn't matter anymore. Because yeah, yeah, and as Muhammad said, if you want it to solve for where the end of the stick was, you're going to start off by following the center point anyways. And then you can, you know, look at where it is in its rotation and then, you know, kind of add a length and figure out what their angle is, right? But then it's much better to follow the midpoint at first rather than the end point. So this is why the center of mass is an incredibly powerful tool in problem solving in physics. Uh, any questions about this at all? Okay. Mm, new page. Now let's talk about um, elastic collisions of two bodies. Mm. Right. Okay, so uh, what these formulas that I'm going to describe to you are now going to talk about is, um, let's just say you have one block, you have, you have two blocks, right? Uh, at masses M1 and M2. And you know, it could be sliding. Uh, and then one of them has a velocity of v1, another one has a velocity of v2. So now notice that v1 and v2 do not necessarily have to be in opposite directions. Like um, it's fine as long as like m1 and m2 uh, do at some point touch, right? Because if you have v2 going this way and then m2 is going like much faster than m1 in the same direction, then they're never gonna touch. So uh, that's not the case we're considering. But then, you know, if V2 were in the same direction as V1, but it's smaller, then they do touch at some point. And then that works for our thing as well. Okay, so what this is going to tell us is um, what are the final velocities of M1 and M2? Okay, so to start off, uh, who wants to tell me like what quantities are preserved in an elastic collision? So what quantities are preserved? Uh, P and K, kinetic energy plus momentum, good. So let's write that down. Uh, so first of all, uh, the case we're going to consider first is um, in the case where m2, uh, where v2 is equal to zero, right? And then you'll see why we will be able to uh, assume this and how we can bring this into like a more general sort of perspective. So first, let's assume v2 is equal to zero, right? Um, so we know that p is conserved. And we know that kinetic energy is conserved. So how do we put that into um, like a formula? How do we put that into math? Mm. All right, so for now, I'm going to call this V1i and V2i. V2i is going to be zero for now. Um, and then let's say the final velocities are Vf1 and Vf2. And this is what we're trying to find. This is what we want. All right, www. All right, so uh, Mohammed says half mv1i plus half mv2i equal to well, okay, you can kill the, uh, I, I don't see why the one halves are necessary here actually, but <laughs> yeah, this is the conservation of momentum. Right? 
Uh, okay, yeah, Jeremy said the whole thing. So the, the conservation of momentum says that M1 V, uh, V1 I plus M2 V2 I is equal to uh, M1 V F1 plus M2 V F2. So then for now, we know that uh, V2 I is equal to zero. All right, so let's get rid of this for now. Okay, and then what Mo said, except with the velocity squared. Kinetic energy conservation, uh, half, and then we can get rid of the halves because um, it's present everywhere. All right, so M1 uh, V1 I, Harib, do you want to raise your hand? Yeah, what's up? Uh, so kinetic energy is conserved because there's no potential energy? Uh, it's not that, no, this is how we defined elastic collisions. Right, that no kinetic energy is lost. Okay. But is that cleared up? Got it. Okay. Um, so M V one I squared plus M two V V two I squared is equal to M one V one F squared plus M two V two F squared. Right. And again, because V2I is zero for now, uh, this also becomes zero. Okay. Now, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to group together all the terms with M1. All right. So I'm going to make a new page for this. Uh, we get M1 times uh, V1I squared, but then now we subtract um, the other term because we were carrying it over from the other side, right? So V1F squared is equal to M2V2F squared, okay? Uh, and now we multiply this by, okay. And then now this is the difference of squares. So how do we factor this? How do you factor difference of squares? Uh, I plus F, I minus F, good. All right, this looks good so far. Okay, but then now we look at the first equation, which is the conservation of momentum, right? Conservation of momentum says that M1 times um, V1I minus V1F is equal to M2 VF2, right? So like we, so this thing here looks really familiar. Uh, why you subtract I minus F and not F minus I? Because we had I squared minus F squared equals to I plus F times I minus F. Cool. Ari? All right. I'm assuming that's backtrack a little bit. Okay, so what we did was I moved this term over here. All right, and we subtracted M1 V1 F squared from both sides, which is how we get M1 V1 I squared minus M1 V1 F squared. And then I factored out the F. Right. And then the right side still stays the same. Got it? Okay, cool. Um, so now from the momentum conservation equation, like this looks really familiar, M1 V1I minus V1F, right? And uh, not squared, sorry. And we're gonna replace this thing in our equation with M2VF, right? So, um, yeah. This thing becomes M2 times VF. And now we can kill off M2VF from both sides. So boom, 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 and then this gets rid of the square. So then what we're left with is V1I 
plus V1F is equal to uh, V2F. Right, and this is like already looking pretty nice already. Okay. Um, now we can put this again with our conservation of momentum equation, which is uh, M1 V1I minus M2 uh, minus M1 uh, V1F is equal to uh, M2 times V2F. Yeah. Okay, so now what I want you guys to do is I want you to solve this system of equations because um, let's think about this for a second. So how many variables do we have? Uh, we're already given a V1F, a V1I, right? And we want V1F. And we also want, uh, this should be a subscript, V2F. We want V1F and V2F, right? And then V1I, this is a constant, this is given, right? The mass is given, uh, V1I is given, M1 is given, we want V1F, and M2 is given, and we want V2F, right? So you have two equations and two variables. So I want you guys to take like two minutes and solve for V1F and V2F, and then you can like PM me what you got. That is M1 V1I minus M1 V1. Well, it's the negative of the impulse, but we're not really using that. Ooh. Um, so, okay. Uh, yeah, that looks good. And what about the other one? Mm 
1F equals to M1 minus M2. Oh, wait. Um, oh, you guys, okay. Uh, Jeremy, not quite for V1F. Uh, Ivan, Also not quite, wait. Uh, actually, yeah, that looks right. Yeah. Yeah, Ivan, that looks right. Um. Okay, so do you guys want like one more minute or? I have like, Two, three responses. You guys need like three more minutes? Uh, I don't think so. The denominator should have both. All right, so um, if you guys want to, you can like work this out by yourself uh, at home in more detail. But for now, I'll just tell you what the answers are. I think Ivan got them all right. So uh, V1F is going to be equal to uh, V1I uh, times uh, M1 minus M2 over m1 plus m2 All right and then v2f is equal to v1i uh, times 2m1 over m1 plus m2 okay so this is these are like the two body Collision equations. All right, so now what happens, now you, you guys might be asking, like what happens if V2i is not equal to zero, right? Because here in this case, we assumed that V2i was just equal to zero. Now here's the thing, what we just did here is we worked on the problem in the frame of reference of box two, right? Which means that, you know, if, you, if box two were a car, right? And then you were riding in the car, then you can see like, you know, um, the car behind you, which is uh, box one, right? V1, it's gonna be, it's gonna look like it's approaching you at some certain velocity, right? So if I were to, um, if you were standing on the ground, right, and then M1, and then like, uh, this is mass two, right? And this is mass one. Um, and this is uh, V2i, and this is V1i. So this is in the frame of the ground, right? Then you see both boxes are moving. However, in the, 
uh, in the frame of box two only, right? Like if you were standing on top of box two, then the velocity of anything with respect to itself is zero, right? Because um, you are not, you're never moving in relation to yourself. However, what is the velocity of box one with respect to box two? So like if I were, okay, so first of all, if I am walking towards you and you are walking towards me, then um, to you, am I walking like faster or slower? Like to, am I approaching you more quickly or more slowly than if you were to be standing still? Like if we were walking towards each other, faster, right? So then therefore it would make sense that the velocity of mass one with respect to mass two in the frame of mass two would be faster than V1i, right? So then what do you guys think um, V1i? Uh, what do you think like this vector is? The, the, uh, the, uh, the magnitude of this vector over here. Like it should be more than V1i from common sense. Yeah, so V1i plus V2i, that's exactly correct. So basically what happened here was that we basically subtracted away the velocity of M2 by entering into its frame, right? So then that means like we applied a velocity of V2i on everything this way by entering into its frame. Then that means if uh, for mass two, if we added V2i left and then V2i right, then it would completely cancel, right? However, for the first box, we would just have uh, V1i plus V2i, right? Because then now they're facing in the same direction, right? So like now we can, we can apply like the same sort of strategy to um, these formulas that we have for two-body collisions, where if we assumed a V1, a V2i to be zero, right? Then that means all we have to do is we have to add back this velocity that we subtracted. We have to add this back, right? So therefore, um, in general, V1f is going to be um, like we're so to the to the observer you are moving at v two i so if you were to um, go back to the lab frame right then you'd be v two i slower right so then what you do is just you just take this and then you subtract uh, v two i is it subtract uh, yes, you subtract V2i. Okay, and then the same thing here. You just take this and then you subtract back the V2i uh, that you sort of added to your frame before. Um, any questions? We will go over relative motion more rigorously in the future, but I'm just hoping like this is clear to you. Like if you're on a bus, then if you're, if you're approaching someone, then to you, like they're walking towards you faster than if you were to be like on the side and watching them walk. I'm Logie, what does that mean? I'm lost. Okay, so uh, like what, what sort of question do you have? Uh, what, are you, what are you confused about? Other than the reference frame stuff. I get the reference stuff. Wait, so what exactly are you sort of lost on? I need like something a little bit more specific. Like, so do you understand how, um, do you understand how we got like these equations, V1F and V2F? Oh, deriving the system of equations. Um, deriving the system of equations was just, you know, like algebra, right? So. First of all, we knew about the conservation of momentum and the conservation of kinetic energy. Like, you know that, right? Uh, yes? 
I need some response, please. Yes, okay. Um, so from here, we basically um, use these two equations. Um, we, we sort of manipulated them and moved stuff around, right? So then we moved, first we said V2i was zero, right? So these things canceled out. And then we uh, subtracted M1, V1f on both sides to get this equation, right? Factored out the difference of squares. So M1, V1i plus V1f times V1i minus V1f, right? Okay, so um, are we good up to like here? We just subtracted uh, one of the kinetic energy thingies and factored it. Cool. Yeah, it's algebraic manipulation. Got it, okay. And then we factored out the difference of squares into uh, vi plus vf and vi minus vf, right? But then we saw that we can manipulate the, um, the kinetic energy, I mean, we can manipulate the conservation of momentum equation into m1 times vi minus vf, right? Which is something we can find, oops, something we can find over here, right? Uh, m1 times uh, vi minus vf. So then uh, what I did was I replaced this term with m2 vf because I know they're equivalent from uh, momentum, right? Uh, and then, you know, finally we just get uh, from here to here, uh, v1i, uh, because like these two are now gone and then because they canceled. So uh, v1i plus v1f, which is what's left on the left side is equal to v2f, which is what, what's left on the right side. Uh, and then uh, after that, we, um, we put this back with the conservation of momentum equation, which is just m1 v1i plus m2 v2i, but that's zero, right, is equal to m2 v2f plus m1 v1f, and then we subtracted that over. And then uh, we have two equations and two variables, we just solve for them. And I'm not going to solve, uh, I'm not going to like go through solving because I trust you guys know how to solve linear equations. But, you know, um, yeah, we get v1f is equal to something in terms of the constants, it turns out to be this, and V2F turns out to be something in terms of the constants, which turns out to be V1I to M1 over M1 plus M2. Uh, anything? Yeah, does that clear it up? The algebra is just throwing me off. Well, okay, so I can, um, I'm just gonna say like, I, I guess you can go through this again by yourself at home, like because these slides will be posted, right? So then maybe that'll get you a better feel for the algebra. Yeah, but then I guess like, um, this is like just a bunch of algebra, right? But then, you know, we have to make sure that it makes sense conceptually, which is actually a good point. We have to check our work, right? We have to uh, know that these equations are actually the correct thing. So um, what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do something called like checking limiting cases, which is something you should do after solving every physics problem and deriving some formula. Checking using extreme cases. All right, so then uh, we said that uh, V1F is equal to uh, V1I times M1 minus M2 over M1 plus M2. And then V2F is equal to V1I times two times M1 over M1 plus M2, all right? Okay, so first of all, let's consider like, okay, what are the extreme cases we can consider in order to uh, make sure that this makes sense? One thing goes very fast. The sun collides with the earth. Uh, okay, I'm actually going to go with that one first. Uh, no, we're actually not going to work with velocities um, because we don't, we don't know the final velocities, right? And then uh, because the uh, velocity, the initial velocity is just a constant factor on the outside, that's not really going to tell us much. So yeah, we're gonna work with the masses because that's what the, like, the confusing thing on the inside is. So the sun collides with the earth. 
Um, all right, so what, what do you want to do this on, M1 or M2? Well, okay, like I said, the initial velocity doesn't really help with checking because that's just a factor on the outside, right? So we can consider like M1 is great, like a lot bigger than M2 and M, uh, or we can also check if M1 is strictly less than M2. 6E25, yeah, I don't know. Uh, you can work on your own Fermi questions. <laughs> okay. So what happens if M1 is much larger than M2? Then we got that uh, V1F is equal to V1I. Now let's look at the inside. So if M1 were a lot larger than M2, then what do we get on the bottom? Like what can we approximate the bottom to? Okay, so let's just say like I weighed um, some amount of pounds. I weighed like uh, 130 pounds, right? And then uh, I, you know, okay. I'm sorry about that. My Wi-Fi is decided to act up. Let's see if my whiteboard saved. It did not. Uh, okay, I'll write up something for you guys later. Well, I mean, it's all in the lecture notes, right? So you guys can just look at that later. Oh, uh, can you guys like hear me and see me okay? Hello? Uh... You're muted. All right. Um, sorry about that. Um, can you guys like hear and see me okay? Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, let's go. It didn't save my whiteboard, great. Uh, this will be in the lecture notes, like I said. Uh, you guys can take a look later. But, so we said that uh, V1F is equal to uh, V1I times uh, M1 minus M2 over M1 plus M2, right? And then uh, V2F is equal to V1I times uh, 2M1 over M1 plus M2. Right, okay, so the first case I want to check is M1 is larger than M2, a lot larger, right? So 1 V1F is equal to uh, V1I times, okay, so um, I don't know if you heard me say this, but uh, let's just say that, you know, I was walking by, like I, I weigh, for example, let's just say I weighed like 100 pounds and a speck of dust landed on my shoulder, right? So does that contribute significantly to my mass? Yeah, so it's kind of like, um, so my mass is like magnitudes higher than the mass of a speck of dust, right? Which means that in our approximation, we can say that M2 doesn't really matter when we're summing or when we're subtracting, All right? So this just becomes V1F is equal to uh, V1I. Yeah, this is M1 over M1. So, and then this just becomes one. So this is V1F equals to V1I, All right? So no change. And now let's, let's think about this conceptually. There's a large block and then a teensy block, All right? So this is M2 and this is M1 and uh, M1 goes this direction. So now um, M2, M1 collides with M2, right? And yeah, as Mo said, um, the small block is just going to like completely knock it out of the park. And yeah, it's reasonable that M the speed of M1 is not going to change a lot, right? Okay. So like now we know in that case, it makes sense. What about V2F? Uh, this becomes V1I 
times 2m1 over m1, because we can approximate up the m2. These cancel out. And this is actually equal to 2v1i. Now, this doesn't make immediate sense, but you know, it's an interesting result. It, which is, and it, yeah, it's also reasonable because it's going to be like faster. Is it going to be a bit faster because it just got like a lot of momentum? But you know, okay. Phase two, um, M2, well, twice as fast. Eh, I'd say, I still say that's a bit faster. M2 is a lot larger than M1, right? So what's, I'm going to go through this quickly. Uh, what is V1F? V1F becomes um, negative m2 over m2 times v1i, which is just negative v1i. Now, uh, let's think about this conceptually again. Now you have a small block, and then the big block is just kind of like a wall, right? Because it's big and it's not going to move. So I'm just going to say that this is a wall. Uh, m2 is a wall. Uh, not question mark. So this is going to bounce like this. And then because it's completely elastic, it's just going to go right back with the same velocity, right? Uh, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, now let's look at uh, B2F, right? B2F is equal to uh, 2M1 over M2, that gets approximated out, uh, times V1I. Uh, so 2m1 over m2, because m1 is so much smaller than m2, like this is pretty much zero. So yeah, it makes sense because the wall does not move. And yeah, not all, but we're considering perfectly elastic collisions here. Yeah, so that factor is called like, um, I, I forgot the word for it, but um, it's called like the constant of yeah, I, I don't remember the word for it, but basically it determines like if a ball bounces on the floor, then how high, like how much of its original height would it be at when it bounces back up? So, okay, yeah, but that's sort of a different issue. Um, yeah, so the wall doesn't move and that's great. That makes sense. Uh, and three, let's do like M1 is equal to M2, right? So what happens if two blocks, those are, Yes, they're in the G classroom. Oh, you were with us last year. Okay, welcome back. I haven't seen you. Okay, so M1 is equal to M2. All right, in this case, V1I is equal to zero, or uh, V1F is equal to zero, right? Because M1 minus M2 just becomes zero. Yeah, I'll link it to you later. And what's V2F? V2F is equal to uh, V1I times 2M1 over M1 plus M1, which is just one, right? So this means that in the initial state, um, you know, this goes at some velocity and this is stopped, right? But then in the final state, the first block is stopped and the last block goes forward at that velocity. So, which means the entire momentum of the first block is transferred onto the second block. And, you know, that also, like, when you think about it, it sort of makes sense. And yeah, you can, yeah, that's actually a really interesting thing that I don't have, but I kind of want. <laughs> um, yeah, so this kind of represents like the, like the transfer of momentum that's just complete and then, you know, uh, it's like with the little pendulum thing that when the middle beads sort of, yeah, it's called Newton's cradle. The middle beads stay exactly where they are, but then uh, the momentum is completely transferred. And, you know, that's an example of such a thing. And it's like really cool. Okay, um, so any questions about, you know, how we check for this? Um, and this is like really important at the end of every physics problem to check if your thing makes sense in terms of, um, extreme cases. Uh, I don't know, I, I haven't seen him in a while. I'll ask him about it later. 
All right, so like, if there is there any questions about anything? Because if not, then I will be posting materials plus problem set uh, due on Monday, same time. And yeah, I'll see you guys all next week. No, I taught Newton last year as well. So you can't really say I, I'm in Newton. But hey, y'all are free to go. Have a good week. Is this stuff in the holiday?